Hi gang, welcome to Valentine's Day to all you lovers out there ensconced in the um, joys of love and warmth and all that good canoodling stuff. Uh, my partner's just packing the caravan to head away for a couple of days so that's okay with me. We get to control the TV remote. Now, um, welcome to a couple of new subscribers. I put up a posting yesterday on Facebook, so we've got some old friends came and joined us. Um, beautiful women from uh, my past that were kind and supportive and understanding of this lunatic. Um, and so, thanks for being such great friends all through these years. You know who you are. So, we heard from my brother on the weekend uh, about his uh, memories of Gladstone Avenue, the place that I became a teenager, I believe. A couple of things that I uh, thought about, I didn't mention was this fellow called Dave. When we lived in the Park Hotel, he was uh, a couple of doors down from us. We were the first floor of the, of the hotel block. And he had rather a large head, like a Martian, quite small glasses. He was a projectionist at the Springbok Drive-In. Now rumours spread around uh, that he was a rabbit, which is a, a South African slang term for a homosexual or a gay. I didn't understand any of that, I just knew that the guy uh, was way cool in so far as he let us start going to the driving with him. Sometimes we'd drive him or he'd follow us in his car and um, we could park next to the projection booth, I could run around. The gates were locked, uh, it was about five o'clock, there were no cars here, you know, those, those mounds at the drive-in and he would let me choose the records to put on when people pulled into the drive-in and hung those speakers on their windows, he'd let me put the records on. I remember choosing Paul Simon, Paul Simon's first album, that was the only sort of modern record that Dave had in the projection booth, but all those wonderful films from the 73, 74, you know, those spaghetti westerns, good, the bad and the ugly, some of the terrible spaghetti westerns like Trinity is my name, which I, I loved at the time, saw it recently, rubbish. Um, Carry On Henry, uh, Taking of Pelham 123, The Day of the Jackal, one of Dad's all-time favourites. Uh, you know, they were all, always double features, so I was always struggling to stay awake and, uh, you know, I'd have the blanket and Dad would have his uh, whiskey and... You know, I'd, I'd fall asleep you know, before the second movie was through, but we tried, and the movies were horribly censored by the South African Censorship Board. Another memory, um, before we take you on this next uh, journey I'm going to take you along, was uh, this motorbike we found on the top of the tip at the State Mines. We were in uh, Gladstone Avenue then, I know that. It was the frame of a 1920s motorbike probably worth a lot of money now, but just a frame, no engine, and it had flat tyres, and we stood it up, and I sat on it, and I went down the side of the tip. Uh, some of you will have seen that photo uh, in some of the other clips where I've got the arrow pointing to State Mine. That big hill was the tip, and that was all the stuff they'd bought out of the mine and made a, made a mountain out of it. Anyway, I got down the bottom of this. It was one of the hairiest rides I've ever had. The, the brakes were just uh, you know, thin cables just hanging and they were barely breaking me and the tyres were flat. I pushed that thing all the way home. About an hour, an hour and a half of pushing this. Like, you push a motorbike that's got you know, pumped up tyres, it's pretty hard work. Try pushing one without any uh, air in the tyres. Anyway, I got it home and rode it down the side of the house in Gladstone Avenue. If you looked at the photo, you'll see there's a pathway along the house. So I remembered that and I wanted to uh, share that story with you. The, the will and the, uh, the vigour of, uh, of a young person wanting to um, bring an old motor motorbike chassis home. So one thing I'm going to disagree with my brother Aiden was, was the time frame we're talking about for Gladstone Avenue. I think we were there in 1974 and in fact I've got some evidence for that. In fact I think we were there uh, by New Year's Day 1974 and I'll show you in a short while how I can um, come to that conclusion. So I was 13 and you know you're, you're at a stage around then when 
either your friends or your parents. You, you know, you're starting to lean more towards having fun with your friends than your parents. I mean, we went through that, that stage of being embarrassed by Dad. Dad, at one stage, took up a hobby of charcoal rubbing. He would, he would go with a, a sheet of uh, sort of baking paper. I remember he went to the top of the Catholic Church. He got permission and up the top there was a bell and it had some um, you know, brass engravings and he was using um, crayon or something to, to do these, in, these um, rubbings. He got it from a library book and I remember being totally embarrassed by him. He was coming down the church with these you know, bits of, um, comp of rubbings and some of my friends saw me and I was you know, acutely embarrassed as we are by our parents at that crazy age. So, in 1974, about mid-year, he wanted to take some holidays from work, remembering we had the, uh, the whiz-bang Austin Apache, still pretty much brand new. He wanted to take it for its first road trip. And I remember at the time, sort of leaning towards thinking, oh, I'd rather stay home with my friends, Brian Gould, the Heralds, Alan Moffat, some of the other kids we'll get to hear about. But oh, I've always, oh, I was always conscious of my dad and his feelings. And I thought, it's not fair, he goes on holiday on his own. I'll go with him. And I'm so glad I did. Wow, what a road trip. You're going to hear about it. Because some of those places no longer even exist in the um, format they were. So Dad, as I said to you, went through a uh, conversion to Catholicism. Uh, and he threw himself into going to church and, and hanging out with the other church people a fair bit for a while. But that, that didn't last too long, but he, he maintained an interest in it. So part of the objective of this road trip we took uh, was to head uh, to get to mission stations out in the bush where uh, these African kids were uh, learning to carve things, to buy African carvings. Now I think it was about July of 74 and I think that because as we'll find out when we got to uh, Rhodesia the World Cup was being played between uh, West Germany and uh, the Netherlands but we didn't start there we went first from Brackpan we went across to Botswana now Botswana is an interesting African country insofar as it's one of the rare exceptions that isn't totally broken corrupted and a tin pot uh, dictatorship Botswana actually was quite a successful independent country, still is. Uh, it's very sandy, uh, there's some fantastic game parks up the north, uh, but it's stable. They've never really had any war or any um, uh, disturbances, so they've managed to grow their economy and they're quite a stable, prosperous little country in Africa. So we headed to Botswana first. Uh, the capital is Gaborone, went there many times later on when I'd revisit Africa and we started looking for mission stations. Now, I don't know how we found this mission station, but we headed out into the, uh, they call it the Bundu. There were thorn trees and sometimes giraffe and warthog and, and the road got worse and worse until it was sand. It was, you know, fine sand going up to the axles in the Apache and we, uh, you know, we were struggling and eventually we got, uh, we got up, we got bogged in the sand and we, we had to wait till this tractor came past. He pulled us out and we continued on to the mission station. And uh, sure enough, uh, Dad was talking to these, you know, they were like monks, uh, Jesuits or something, walking around with, you know, their robes in the African uh, sun and all these um, happy African faces were, you know, smiling and saying hello and waving and all sort of thing. So we ended up buying some, or he ended up buying some, I think they're atrocious myself, but uh, they're relics of a lost age. Now I think he bought them to send back as gifts uh, to Nana. We've heard about Nana, the, she's the one that, uh, she's my mum's mum, quite a religious Catholic woman in her own way, although she detested blacks, um, but you know, she was of her era. So Dad sent this to uh, her. Now, obviously it's the mother and child, the Madonna and child. It's very 70s, isn't it? It's sort of like something you might see out of Hair or Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, the, big, the big lips, uh, the big nose. Uh, Nana, I think, um, 
never really displayed them. I think they were put to the back of their wardrobe and never saw the light of day. And that's how I ended up when Nana passed away. They, they came back to me for some reason. Now we also got this. Now that one's not titled by the artist, but this one is. I don't mind this one so much. Same sort of thing, quite a, um, you know, negroid Jesus. Uh, Nana wasn't that keen on. Uh, but I think it's pretty well done. And the, the artist is Joe Guatizzo. Joe Guatizzo. So yeah, we've had those uh, all those years. So, you know, nearly 50 years we've had those. So that's all I remember about our time in Botswana. Uh, I think that probably told Dad that he would need a four-wheel drive if he wanted to keep, uh, you know, exploring mission stations in the Bundu. So we went back to the tar roads. We made our way to Rhodesia. Now, we actually knew somebody to uh, visit in Rhodesia. He was a, name, a fellow called Alf. Alf had been a chess playing um, pal of Dad's. Dad was a, wouldn't say fanatical, but he was a better than average chess player. He loved chess. When he was living in Melbourne, he used to go uh, down to Cheltenham or Morty Alec, he, he was a member, of Bo Morris perhaps, he was a member of a chess club and he'd, um, you know, whenever he could he'd go and play chess and mum used to get jealous and suspicious of him having an affair but really he was just over a chessboard lost in concentration. Now one of those guys that he played chess with was a German called Alf and Alf visited us in Brackpan on his way to Rhodesia. He went to live in uh, Salisbury uh, the capital of Rhodesia, but he also uh, spent some time in Bulawayo, which is where we were intending to meet him. Now this is, I believe, where Dad had the, the germ, the seed of the idea to go and live in Rhodesia uh, as soon as uh, I was packed back to Australia and Aidan followed me a year after. But this was the first time we went. So you've got to remember, crossing from South Africa, which is uh, which, which was Dutch and apartheid, and uh, you know a, almost a, a Nazi state in its own right, into the freedom and the fresh air of Rhodesia, which was very English in its culture and its uh, traditions and, and its way of life. They weren't quite as hard on segregation. It wasn't as strongly enforced as it was down in uh, South Africa. So I think Dad liked that straight away. So we made our way to Bulawayo. We got there about five o'clock in the afternoon. Bulawayo is a beautiful, beautiful African uh, town. I'd say about the same size as Ballarat, like a regional town. Big wide streets with jacaranda trees and they were made that wide so the ox wagons could, could turn around in them. Orderly, clean, and it was a swinging 70s, so we found our way to this apartment block. They were like units, I suppose, in uh, this estate. As soon as we went in, I, I smelt the bananas and the pawpaws and the mangoes. It was a, it felt tropical, it was green, it was lush. And we heard the 70s music coming from this uh, first floor apartment. Now when we went to the door, the door was open. There were African girls in there, 20, 25, in hot pants, in, in little tops with Afro hairstyles and, you know, high heel uh, cork clog shoes and they were, they were bopping and they were, you know, doing those 70s disco beats and, and Alf came bouncing out in his um, Hawaiian shirt or something like that and, Peter, Peter, oh, get him a beer, get, get, get my friend a beer. And, um, in we were ushered, ushered and there was this little black and white TV which was showing, um, you know, the World Cup. And there were Germans and, and Brits and all, they were all older white men. When I say older, they seemed real old to me, but I was 13. They were probably in their early 40s. All single white men that like the old elephant in the, in the group that wanders off on its own. They get to an age where they realise their time is coming, so they leave the the family, the herd, and they wander off and they become what they call in Africa the Tusker elephants. That's what these men were. They'd left their families for whatever reason, as Dad was now finding. He was a bachelor. 
and there they were bopping and grinding with these African girls and of course in South Africa the door would be kicked in and you'd have cocky and um, jackboots and the, the saps they called them, the South African police, the saps would attack you with truncheons and the men would be thrown in the back of uh, divvy vans and the, the African women would be beaten and then uh, locked up in, in their own uh, uh, prisons but not like that in Rhodesia. So that was the groovy thing. Now of course for me, a 13 year old, what are they going to do? They're going to give me a, a soda or a, you know, a soft drink. Not a lot of fun uh, when you sit and watch the adults grind and get progressively louder and progressively more pissed. However, there was this little girl that happened to be about my age. Her name was Jackie, Jackie Hall, little African girl. And um, you know, as, as fashionable as I was, which we were starting to wear jeans, we had, we had jeans, we had t-shirts. So she took to me and I took to her. So I remember we went and sat on these steps uh, below. We could hear the party going on and the adults with the record player and yelling whenever the, the ball was kicked. And, Shoot, shoot, you know. Um, and so we held hands. I'm not sure I'd ever got romantic with a girl before, but I held hands with her, and at some stage I leaned over and I kissed her. Now, this is, and it was terrific, but this is how twisted uh, our thinking had been by, by living in that apartheid regime. Instead, you know. I would have thought I would have rushed, wanted to rush home to tell my friends about this girl I met and I kissed, I kissed her, but I was inside thinking, I, can't, I can never mention this to them. If they find out that I've been kissing a black girl, um, I'll be ridiculed and um, I'll keep this to myself. This will be just my secret. Now actually, Jackie and I were friends for many years. We wrote letters, sweet little letters when we were 13, 14, 15. She went on to boarding school. We knew her mother, Dad knew her mother pretty well. And uh, she became a very su successful businesswoman in what became Zimbabwe. She became very high up in the Zimbabwean rail. And I saw her again uh, in the 1980s. I saw her once more. Very successful uh, African woman. But uh, yeah, there was that sweet, tender little moment where we kissed. So the next place we made our way up to and I don't know how long we stayed in Bulawayo hanging out with Alf uh, and looking around. Uh, I think we went to the Matopos, which is where uh, Cecil John Rhodes is buried with his friend Leander Star Jamison. And they're buried on this, they call it the World's View. It's on the top of a uh, mount, a bit like hanging rock. They're big granite rocks and they've carved into the granite. Uh, a, a tomb for these two men and they look out over the African felt for miles and miles. It's a gorgeous place. I'm pretty sure we went there. All tourists do. Uh, we then made our way to Victoria Falls and that was the first time I saw the magnificence of the falls, one of nature's natural wonders. And you've got to remember as you approach the falls, you feel them and you hear them much sooner than uh, you actually see them. There's a plume of smoke of water that rises into the air. I've approached them by air and you can see way in the distance the, the, the water coming up in the air as, as it plummets, as a Zambezi plummets over the, the gorge and into uh, the canyon and rises up again. They call it the smoke that thunders. So we were first time spectators uh, of this magnificence and his name, David, uh, I presume, you, you got me, I presume, it'll come to me later, he saw them first, Livingston, Dr. Livingston, I presume, he saw them first, so uh, yeah, and all along, there's tracks that you walk along the edge of the falls, it's lush, it's green, there's vines, there's creepers, there's monkeys and little deer, and it's beautiful, uh, and it's tropical, it's hot, and it's so refreshing getting the water spray come back on you. You end up soaking wet as you as you view the uh, Victoria Falls. Anyone, if you ever get a chance, go and see them. So that time they were uh, they were spectacular. Perhaps the first time is always the most spectacular. And both Dad and I were um, taken in by the, 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 the 
you know, the size and the, the magnificence, but in the back of our mind there was a bit of fear as well because this was 74, so not long before there had been some tourists that had been shot from the other side. The other side of the falls was Zambia, where the terrorists, we call them terrorists, in those, uh, these days you'd call them freedom fighters, but the ANC or, the, or ZANU, uh, PF, uh, ZANU, they were the uh, liberation fighters and they, and they would sometimes snipe from the Zambian side or send over rockets um, and you had to be extremely unlucky but it's possible you could be taken out by terrorists while you were viewing the falls as some tourists had, been, had happened sometime before we were there. Now there was a lot of also military um, activity going on, you travelled in convoys because the terrorists were renowned for leaving landmines on the roads. Uh, so you travelled in by convoy, they left early in the morning, there were army trucks at the front and you drove uh, behind them at a, at a slow speed. You didn't have to, you could go on your own if you wanted to, to um, you know, take your chances. There was a caravan camping ground at uh, Victoria Falls, which is a beautiful little um, town again. I would get to know it very well later on. But uh, that first time with Dad, we stayed in the camping ground. We probably slept in the car. Uh, I remember there was a Wimpy uh, restaurant, you know, uh, Wimpy hamburgers. I, uh, I looked forward to that. I did get those at Brackpan, so yeah, loved having a Wimpy burger. Now we went back down to Bulawayo because the next destination was uh, the, the uh, Zimbabwe ruins. They're in a place called, I think, Fort Victoria, or they were, and it's been renamed. Now at the time the popular thinking was that Africans surely couldn't have uh, created these ruins, they look like something out of medieval Europe, there's stone enclosures and, and curving corridors and, and, and you know, imposing a tower, uh, so I remember Dad, you know, saying aloud, I think they were built by Arab slave traders, I think that's what's happened, and of course these days the Zimbabweans are, you know, dec decry that as just us colonial white people looking down on them. Of course, they had the technology and the know-how to build these um, ruins, and uh, they were built by uh, Africans. And in fact, Zimbabwe is named after these stone birds that were found in these uh, ruins. I'll show you some images so you get an idea what I'm talking about. Now, after we left those, there was a decision to be made, and this was my dad through and through. <laughs> Excuse me. So Dad pulled out the map and he says to me, we've got a choice. We can either, from here we can go back down to South Africa and we can curve along and we can go through the top of Swaziland and we can go to Mozambique that way. However, it will be shorter and it will be more direct if we go along from Fort Victoria directly across to the border with Mozambique. But it is dangerous. It's mined. Um, you know, uh, Af uh, uh, terrorists were known to stand up from behind the bushes and spray a car with an AK-47. So he said, "It's up to you." Now, a 13-year-old making a choice like that—it seems a lot, but I trusted him. I said, "No, no, let, let's just go the direct route." And um, so we did. Now I know. Uh, that when we got to the border of Mozambique that the Portuguese had already had what they called their Carnation Revolution over in Portugal. They decided they couldn't maintain these African colonies anymore. It was too much trouble, too much money, too much fighting. They had Angola on the west coast and they had Mozambique on the east coast. So I know at that time because Dad told me that the uh, Portuguese were offering huge exchange rates on their local currency uh, uh, in exchange for South African Rand or for um, you know American dollars. So we crossed into Mozambique when it was still Portuguese and uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, not like that anymore. We drove to Lorenzo Marx, which is now called Maputo, and I've got vague memories, but one of the memories I do have is, is sitting on the seafront. You've got to remember Brackpan is inland 
and we hadn't seen the sea for um, you know some years and eating prawns and Portuguese peri peri and um, just the, the gorgeous azure blue of the of the bay that we looked out into and the Portuguese architecture and that night I remember dad looking around for a chess club you know wanted to play chess against the Portuguese uh, in, uh, in, in um, Mozambique. Um, so I do remember that, but I don't remember anything else. I don't think we stayed very long, a couple of days at the most, before we made our way back to Brackpan. So that was our road trip of 74. And I'm going to show you something that was done around that, uh, that time. Uh, Dad did a painting, and he's, he's actually dated it. And once again, I'm pretty sure he sent it to our grandparents. So let's go and have a look at that, and I'll tell you a bit about it. So this is the painting that Dad did. Now it is, it's of a cause of village. He was never all that happy with it, but it is actually labelled and dated. It says, with all our love to you, Mum and Dad, that's, Na that's Nana and Gram, 1st of the 1st, 1974. Cause of village, hope you like it. Now remember, he was never very happy with that hand on this um, figurine. Uh, he was happy with her and I think she's pretty good actually, I think she's terrific. But yeah, the, the man and the, the nose as well, you can never quite get that right. It's um, watercolour and it's just done on a bit of cardboard. Dad was never one for anything grand, he just used bits of um, material from the bakery to do his painting. So it, it just stayed in the dust in the garage for years and years and on the recommendation of a friend of mine, I actually did something with it a couple of years ago and framed it, so that that tells me, and I remember him in the kitchen of Gladstone Avenue doing it, so that tells me we were in Gladstone Avenue by the beginning of 1974.